based series. And uh, today we are going to be discussing on the diagnosing of hypoxemia and the use of pulse oximetry. Our panelists, uh, we're going to be led by Dr. Eugene Tuishime from the Institute of uh, Medical Education and Global Health. Also, we are going to have Dr. Jean Paul Mbukiehe from the University of Rwanda. And our co-panelists for today are going to be Dr. Celestine Seneza from the Hospital University de Buta and Dr. Alain Irakoze from the University of Rwanda. So a bit of a project echo etiquette and housekeeping uh, rules. So remember that our program is based on the foundation of love and respect. Uh, please respond kindly rather than react if you disagree with something. It is everyone's responsibility to keep uh, this webinar a safe space. We will be using the chat function for question and answer at the bottom of the screen. Please send all your questions through the chat box and feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, turn on your video, position your webcam effectively to show your face if you're alone or to capture the whole group if you're in a group. If you have any IT issues, you can send the message through chat to EcoIT for assistance. And also remember that this session is being recorded and your attendance is a consent to be recorded. Also, please be mindful of infection prevention and control and try to limit the uh, numbers of people joining from one gathering place and practice physical distancing. After those few remarks of introduction, I would like to welcome Dr. Eugene and the panelists to take over the session and lead us to our session today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you everyone for for joining. So today um, we are happy to, to do our second session uh, to discuss about hypoxemia. But before we start, um, I would like us to, to remember what we discussed last time yeah. about triage and, and ask people um, if they have managed to, to change anything, if someone has something to share before we start. So they are welcome. We can have one or two comments before we start our session today. Uh, thank you. Anyone from the participant who would like to share um, what happened after our first session? if they were able to, to see any COVID patient or to uh, use this, anything we discussed last time. Okay, if there is no one you can, once you have an idea, you can put that in the chat. Uh, so before we start, also I would like to to give like a few seconds to each uh, panelist to introduce themselves, and then we will start from there. Jean Paul and Are, uh, we start with Jean Paul and then Are. Jean Paul, can you introduce yourself? Yes, please. I'm Dr. Jean Paul. I'm an anesthesiologist working at the Butare University Hospital, and I'm a lecturer of anesthesia at the University of Rwanda. I'm happy to be with you in this second session of ECO. Are? Okay. Probably Are is not near the microphone. Okay. I think we can start. Arana, can you please share the the learning resource center? Thank you very much. So before we start, feel free to, to stop me anytime. Uh, we, 
we'll be discussing throughout the, the session. So, yeah. everyone, please mute yourself. So, the objective for today um, about the diagnosis of hypoxemia using pulse oximetry, we, we are hoping to be able to understand how to use the pulse ox oximeter during the COVID pandemic to understand and recognize pulse oximeter latency to select and rank oxygen delivery devices by FIO2 delivered, to use the life box triage tool to select the most appropriate oxygen delivery device available, to be able to understand the use of the life box triage tool to create oxygen therapy goes up and down, to assess our facilities non invasive delivery devices, then we'll be able also to assess the type of oxygen supply we have at our facilities. And we need to be able to interpret data obtained using password oximetry uh, and to be able to understand. Uh, List condition. Uh, can you go back, please? Yeah, we, we need to be able to list conditions that interfere with accurate pulse oximeter reading and clean and maintain pulse oximeter device appropriately. So before we, we go to those objectives, let's remember our case. Can go down a little bit. So you remember we had a 57 years old male patient who presented with a four days history of chills, weakness, and cough. His wife was a nurse and tested positive for COVID-19 three days ago. The saturation was zero at 89, and the wife sent the patient to the emergency department. At the hospital, the patient was screened for COVID-19 risk factors, isolated from other patient, and is wearing a face covering. You and the, the nurse student are wearing PPE for contact droplet and airborne precautions. The patient admits is short of breath and is move, able to move and is able to eat but denies any fever, uh, shortness of breath at rest and the loss of taste or smell. He states he has been less active and staying in bed. So the vital signs are below. You can go down a little bit. So the heart rate is 95 beats per minute. The, the respiratory rate is 24. The blood pressure 95 over 52. And the SpO2 89%. The temperature 36.5. And do you remember that you recognized that the patient was a hypoxemic? And you start the oxygen by nasal cannula at five liters per, per minute, and the saturation increased to 97. So this is our patient. Then here is the question. How is the pulse oximetry used in the COVID-19 pandemic? So in order to be able to answer that question, we're going to watch a video. Uh, it, it's a wrong video, but it has all the information we need in order to, use, to be able to use uh, the pulse oximetry appropriately, especially for patients with COVID-19. Please pay attention for this important video, and then you can ask any question after the video. This video shows the use of a pulse oximeter in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Severe COVID-19 primarily affects the lungs. Measuring oxygen saturation is essential for deciding when to use precious oxygen resources during the pandemic. A pulse oximeter is used to measure oxygen saturation and can help identify severely ill patients who should be hospitalized and receive oxygen therapy. Please note, available oxygen 
Flow rates and administration practices will vary according to local protocols and resources. Make sure you know what kind of oxygen therapy is available in your institution, how it can be delivered, and what local guidelines are in place. Do you need to measure your patient's oxygen saturation? You will need to decide whether your patient should have their oxygen saturation measured. To decide, you will need to ask five questions. One, does your patient have a fever? Two, does your patient have a cough or difficulty breathing? Three, does your patient have an increased respiratory rate? Four, does your patient have any emergency signs, such as obstructed or absent breathing, severe respiratory distress, central cyanosis, shock, coma, convulsions, or uncontrolled vomiting? Five, is your patient being admitted as an inpatient? Fever, any known fever over the last 14 days is an indication to measure oxygen saturation. Cough or difficulty breathing. Any cough, difficulty with breathing, or shortness of breath over the last 14 days is an indication to measure oxygen saturation. Difficulty breathing can be any abnormal breathing pattern, including but not limited to breathing too fast, too slow, too deep, noisy breathing, labored breathing, or any pain or discomfort associated with breathing. Increased respiratory rate. An increased respiratory rate is an indication to measure oxygen saturation. This is a little more complicated than the other reasons to measure saturation, as normal respiratory rate varies with age. Let's spend a little time here reminding ourselves of abnormally high respiratory rates in different age groups. In adults and children 16 years of age and older, a respiratory rate of 22 breaths per minute or more is abnormal. In children five to 15 years of age, a respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute or more is abnormal. In younger children from one to five years of age, a respiratory rate of 40 breaths per minute or more is abnormal. In infants two to 11 months of age, a respiratory rate of 50 breaths per minute or more is abnormal. In neonates and very young infants up to two months of age, a respiratory rate of 60 breaths per minute or more is abnormal. Any patient who has an increased respiratory rate should have their oxygen saturation measured with a pulse oximeter. Emergency signs. Emergency signs are an immediate indication for admission and resuscitation, including administering oxygen therapy. Resuscitate, administer oxygen, and measure the patient's oxygen saturation if any of the following signs are present. Severe respiratory distress. Signs of severe respiratory distress can include obstructed or absent breathing, head nodding in younger children, nasal flaring, grunting, usually in younger children, tracheal tugging, intercostal retraction or inward pulling of the skin between the ribs during inspiration, and deep lower chest wall indrawing or inward pulling of the skin below the ribs during inspiration. Other emergency signs include poor perfusion or weak pulse, which is a sign of shock, coma, convulsions or seizures, or vomiting all food and drink and medicines. If your patient is being admitted to the hospital with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, or for any other respiratory illness, use a pulse oximeter to check oxygen saturation, along with vital signs. For patients who are under simple observation and do not have low oxygen levels, these should be checked at least every six to 12 hours, depending on illness severity. How to measure oxygen saturation. When using a pulse oximeter to measure oxygen saturation, remember to use the correct probe for your patient. Young children in particular need appropriately sized probes. It may be difficult to get a reading in critically sick patients. We recommend two strategies to make it easier to measure the oxygen saturation in younger children below two years of age. First, using the big toe, as this allows the child to sit comfortably in the caregiver's lap and be comforted. Second, you may allow a breastfeeding child to feed during the measurement to improve cooperation. You may have to wait 30 to 45 seconds for the pulse oximeter to display the pulse rate and oxygen saturation readings. If your patient is very unwell and you cannot get a reading, administer oxygen and call for help immediately. 
How to use the oxygen saturation to decide next steps. You have now used a pulse oximeter to measure the oxygen saturation of your patient. Depending on the result, you will decide to administer oxygen or plan how to monitor your patient without oxygen therapy. If the patient's oxygen saturation is 94% or higher and they do not have any emergency signs, you do not need to administer oxygen at this point. In this case, you should follow local protocols for COVID-19 testing and isolation. Remember, all inpatients should have their oxygen saturation measured with their vital signs every six to 12 hours. If the oxygen saturation reading is less than 94%, or if there are emergency signs, administer oxygen via nasal prongs or standard oxygen face mask and check the saturation every two to five minutes. The next oxygen therapy decision is made depending on the outcome of 15 minutes of oxygen therapy. After 15 minutes of oxygen therapy, check the oxygen saturation again with your pulse oximeter and check whether the reading is 90% or above or less than 90%. If the oxygen saturation is 90% or above, continue standard oxygen therapy as you are doing and monitor the patient. If oxygen saturations rise to 96% or higher, reduce the oxygen flow rate. Oxygen saturation and vital signs should be measured at least every four to six hours while oxygen therapy is ongoing. If the oxygen saturation is less than 90%, oxygen support should be maximized. Oxygen flow should be increased where possible. Other measures include using a face mask with an oxygen reservoir for adults and a head hood for infants. Once again, oxygen saturation should be checked every two to five minutes. Check oxygen saturation using a pulse oximeter after 15 minutes of maximal low flow oxygen therapy. If the oxygen saturation is 90% or above, continue maximal oxygen therapy and monitor the patient. Oxygen saturation and vital signs should be measured at least every four to six hours while oxygen therapy is ongoing. Oxygen saturation should be maintained between 90 and 96%. If the oxygen saturation is less than 90% on maximal oxygen therapy, refer for ICU admission where available and escalate respiratory support where possible. Oxygen saturation should ideally be monitored continuously. Oxygen saturation measurement is the best tool you have to decide when to use and maximize precious oxygen resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. We thank you for all that you are doing for your patients during these difficult times. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing the video. So we can take few questions or clarifications now. So you can write any question in your chat. We can give you 30 seconds. If there's any question or clarification or any comment before we move to the next topic. So in the meantime, Arana, you can go back to the main session. You can go back to the main session. Yeah. Yeah, people are very quiet. What does it mean? Does it mean that everything was clear? Okay, at least put your take home message. At least two things you took away from that video you can use if you see a patient who is hypoxemic and you are giving oxygen, especially in COVID-19 patients.
Yeah, people are starting to write. Let's wait. Okay, that's very good. Indication for oxygen measurement. Yeah, it's a good takeaway. Okay, when to deliver oxygen saturation. And yeah, just to remind ourselves that those indications include the presentation of the patient Patient in respiratory distress, patient in with fever. Patient in shock yeah, and other examples. Patient who are who are being admitted to the hospital. Those are the things they, they discussed in the video. Especially that in a patient, we, we check like pulse oximetry all the time. Yeah, I like the message from Oscar saying if the SPO2 is below 90 with maximum flow, you will refer the patient to ICU. Uh, and if the patient from Emmanuel, if the, the saturation is below 94, you need to consider to give oxygen. Yeah, the other thing I can add, once the, you have you have reached a saturation of 96, you may consider to decrease the, your flow of oxygen you are giving. Okay, I think that's good. From, from panelists, uh, Are, do you have anything to add on this before we move? Eugene. Yes. I have something to add and to comment. Please go ahead. We can't hear you and mute yourself. Jean Paul. We can't hear you. Okay, we can't hear Jean Paul. Um, he will talk when possible. Maybe we can go to the next question. We need to ask ourselves uh, how long after starting oxygen? Hello, hello. Okay, we can hello. hear you now. Okay, thank you. I'm saying, I was saying that if a patient is having oxygen saturation, which is less than 90% on room area, like 88, 89, it means that this patient is hypoxemic and need oxygen. And this patient need oxygen. And you start by nasal cannula because the nasal cannula is the, the, the tools or the device which is used if a patient is mildly hypoxemic, need uh, more than 21%. All of us, if we are out of oxygen, we are having more, we are using 21%. And the nasal cannula is, use, is having 21 to 40% FiO2. So if a patient is mild hypoxemic, need a little bit of oxygen to saturate well. That means to saturate more than 90% need a nasal cannula. If a patient need oxygen, uh, which need a little bit of FiO2 between 40 to 60, let's say a patient who is saturating 81 to uh, to 87 percent 
that means you can use a simple facial mask. A simple, a, a simple facial mask will provide FiO2 between 40 to 60. That means this patient is mild, uh, is moderate hypoxemic. You can use a simple facial mask. In a setting where you have non rebulisa facial mask, that means a patient is very hypoxic, maybe need an FiO2, which is ranging between 65 to 95%. The patient who is very hypoxic, the saturating in the 70s, in the 60s, that moment you will use a high FiO2, a, a device which is able to deliver a high FiO2 is an anilibulifa facial mask or a facial mask with a reservoir. And then you can use that tool, that device. That means if you have a patient who is very hypoxic, who is having a high respiratory rate, please consider a device which will deliver a high FiO2, which is a non rebulifa facial mask or a facial mask with a reservoir. Again, if a patient is, this, is saturating more than 90, it's a time of winning from oxygen because long standing oxygen is very, is very harmful to a patient. So make sure if a patient is, is saturating well on high, on low FiO2, like nasocanera, try to think about winning from, from oxygen. That is my odon, my add-on. Do okay. you understand it? Any question about it? I was clarifying how to choose which device to use on a hypoxic patient and when to discarate the care, when to, to win off from oxygen. Thank you very much. Any Sean. question? Yeah, if there are questions, we can put the questions in the chat. And yeah, this is very, very important. Our participant do, could understand what device to choose. When you have a patient who is hypoxic, when a patient come on in your office at the emergence and you put a pulse oximetry, it is reading more than 90% of oxygen saturation you realize that this patient is hypoxic and you have different oxygen devices. Nasocanera, simple facial mask, and a facial mask with the reservoir. Which one do you choose to put on the patient? In which situation, in which circumstance? This is very, very important. Thank you very much, Jean Paul. So, um, yeah. We can take questions in the chat, but in the meantime, we can go to our next question we need to ask ourselves. So once we, we place a person oximetry um, or on the patient, how long after starting of oxygen should, should the SPO2 increase? Because not instant, in, in that time, at that particular second, you are putting the pulse oximetry you don't get the, the reading immediately. So what do you think? Is it maybe after 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 50 seconds, or after a few minutes, what do you think? Yeah, you can go, yeah, you can go down. Um, so I have already shared the article to the WhatsApp group. Uh, did some of the people get a chance to, 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 to read the article? Okay, I don't know if you got a chance to read the article. We don't have enough time to go through the whole article, but you have access to the article. You can read for, for on the article all the details, but the answer is about 28 seconds. So one, once you, you, you put the pulse oximetry on the finger, it will take about 28 seconds to be able to give you a reading. And in some settings, they have a, a forehead uh, probe and then that one also, it will take shorter time, about 23 seconds. 
but also once someone has a hypo hypoxemia below 90, it will take about 100 seconds. So it's about one minute and 40 seconds to tell you if someone is being hypoxemic. So that's why we need also to, to know our patient and to know that the reading may delay and they start acting immediately. Um, I don't know if you have any question about that, but I will let you read the article because the article is available. So, and the next question we need to ask ourselves is how to use the, 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 the oxygen delivery devices. And I think Jean Paul gave already discussed about them. Maybe you can click on that um, uh, to just to show uh, again uh, the FIO2 delivered by each device very quickly, and then we can move on. Thank you, Arana. You can click on that. Yeah. Yeah, you can go down a little bit. So as, we, as Jean Paul said, with nasoprong, you can achieve FIO2 from 28. If you are giving one liter per minute, to 40% if you are giving five liters per minute. Uh, so remember to give humid, humidified oxygen um, that's uh, well tolerated by the patient. So for nasopharyngeal catheter, uh, I, I have never used it, but you can achieve FIO2 at, uh, at around 60%. Face mask, I think these are always available in our settings. And you can achieve FIO2 between 44 and 60%. Um, and the, the last one, which is also available in our settings, is a mask with reservoir. Uh, you can achieve a FIO2 uh, up to 95% on 15 liters. But again, as Rapport said, remember if someone is saturating well above 96, go down to the lowest FIO2 you need to achieve that saturation. Venturi masks, they are not always available, but we need just to, to be aware of the FIO2 you can achieve between 24 and 60%. But also remember, you are expert in this field. We are not discussing this for you for the first time. These are the things you know, and really our goal is to be able to share the knowledge to other people, nurses, um, or, or other providers who don't have the, the same um, expertise, because it will be called for all those very hypoxemic patients. Also keep in mind, if you are transferring the patient, just keep in mind how much oxygen you are giving and how much you have in the syringe. Maybe you have time to discuss more about that. I don't know, we can go back to uh, the main session. If you allow me, I can give you a supplement. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, if you are giving oxygen with nasoprone, there is a flow rate. When you are using a nasoprone, don't you go about 60 liters per minute. If you are giving by nasoprone, one to 60 liters per minute, per minute, it's enough. If you go by seven liters per minute, eight liters per minute, nine liters per minute, 10 liters per minute, when you are giving with another prone, you are harming a patient. When you go beyond 60 liters per minute, make sure you are making a patient to be uncomfortable and you are not helping a patient, except putting a patient to be uncomfortable, it's not good. If you see that you are giving oxygen and a patient is not saturating you, is, make, is not making you satisfactory oxygen saturation, thinking about another device, rather than going of seven liters per minute by using another product. So when you are using like a facial mask, you know that you are giving the FIO2, we say, between 40 to 60. And you are giving a flow rate more than 10 liters per minute. You are not helping the patient because Paul, we lost you. Um... Hello. 
Hello. Uh, I'm so happy. Just uh, it's um, Irakoze. My my mic was not working well, but I think they fixed it. So I'd like only to share with you my own experience with voluntary mask. It's 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 something that I didn't find in my hospital, but I was uh, I was I amazed to see it. I was saying about this simple facial mask, and the data has to go on. Facial mask is a very good. A flow will it be, you can go up to 15 liters per minute. If a, a facial mask is having a reservoir, you are allowed to have like that flow. But if you don't have, if you don't have a reservoir, don't you go above 10 liters per minute. Unless you are using a simple facial mask, which will be six, up to 16 liters per minute. If you are using, right, there is a, another tool that we don't have in our setting, which is naso canida high flow. This naso canida high flow, we don't have it in our setting, but you can go like 60 liters per minute. And you are able to give an FIO2 of 21 up to 100. It's a nasocanida high flow, but we don't have it in our setting. And this tool is being used with COVID patient, but we don't have it, this device in our setting. Do you understand me clearly? The Venturi mask also. The Venturi mask, you can use the Venturi mask. It is a high flow, but the FIO2 is limited it can't reach to a hundred. It's the Venturi mask is something which is in between simple facial mask and the non rebreather facial mask. Any question about it? And remember in your setting, in the, all the hospital in Rwanda, we don't have a Venturi mask except at King Faisal. Any question? Uh, just um, uh huh. Go ahead. Hey, uh, please go ahead. So it was. It, was, it is not a, a question just to talk about voluntary mask. I know many people don't have it. So as I work in that hospital, I like to share with people how it works and how it is helping us once we decide to use it. So this special mask has special devices. I don't know if you saw in the picture those red color, yeah, yellow, white devices. I don't know if you can, I don't know if you saw it. So those small devices, yeah, yeah. See where she does. That's great. Once we, we, we use such devices, it help us to give a fixed FIO2. So those like the orange one can go to like around 50%. So it's so good to use those, those one because you give a kind of fixed, FIO2. Once you decide once of those device you can use. So it's total it's, it's different from other uh, way of giving oxygen because those have a variance or a range of FIO2 where you can go. But with those small devices, I think here you see one which is uh, yellow, white, orange. So according green, according to the one you put, it will help you to give a kind of, you know that I, I will give 50%, I will give 40%. So that was a good experience. Uh, we have it in King Faisal and I saw, as I work for a COVID center, a movable one right now in Rwanda. So I saw it also in uh, Ruhenge. So people from Ruhenge, if they are with me, I'd like to tell them once they want to see it, where they can find it. It is in one place in Ruhengeri, or a uh, refer hospital, and uh, it can help them also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ale. Mm. So we can go back to our main, um, main session. Yeah, so we, we don't need to discuss about how to escalate oxygen therapy because we have been discussing about that. And I thank Ari and Jean-Paul for, for their valuable comment. So we can go back to our case. So if you remember our case, our 57 years old patient with suspect COVID-19, 
now you continue to do a history on the physical exam and you get more information. So on the, on the past medical history, the patient has history of polio, diabetes, and HIV. Uh, he, he had a previous inguinal hernia repair in 1988, and he, he is on heart therapy, long acting insulin, and um, short acting insulin. Uh, her mother has died. Um, she has a history of hypertension and diabetes, and the father also died with history of emphysema, and she has one sister who is healthy and two children who are healthy. On social history, uh, he works in construction, he drinks some alcohol, and he doesn't smoke. He doesn't use any drugs. You review other systems, uh, you found some sequelae from childhood polio, otherwise no other issues. Then you are working for your nurse student, and the, the student will ask you, what did you plug the oxygen into? So how are you giving the oxygen? Where is the oxygen coming from? And that will bring us to our next question. So what are the different type of oxygen supply? And which uh, does your facility use? And I think that's very important for us to, to be aware of what is available in our hospitals our source of oxygen. Um, so this document is available for us to use. Maybe you can go down a little bit. You can go down Arana. There's a, a table we can just yeah go down. There's a table we can discuss about potential source of oxygen and see what you have in our hospitals. Keep going. Yeah, there. So uh, if you can see on this table on the left side, the, the, some source of oxygen includes, includes cylinders and concentrators of oxygen, oxygen plant, and the liquid oxygen. So maybe Jean Paul and the other will share the experience, but in my previous experience, in our most of the hospitals, we had oxygen from cylinders and then some concentrators as well. Uh, and I don't think most of the hospitals, they don't have oxygen plant, but in my former hospital at the Greenhouse, we had one oxygen plant. And it's good to know what is already available uh, so that we, we know if we will be short of oxygen. Okay. Are do you have any addition on your experience yes. about Source of oxygen in your, your hospital. Uh, thank you so much. So as I said, now nowadays I work for a COVID center, which is a kind of movable and assessing our capacities in our country. So as you said, it is a bit tricky. It's not easy to find oxygen plant. I saw it in a few places, not more than four now, right now. So in 28 hospitals that I already visited in our country. But what was really available, there were oxygen from different sites from E to H and concentrators are around. But, you know, with concentrators, I don't know if it will be talked uh, a little bit, but there's some limitation from source of electricity sometimes on and off or how to uh, use it uh, in efficient way, how to, if it is not working, how to repair it. So, all those things are challenges. I don't know if it is time to talk about it, but mainly oxygen plants are rare. And um, I saw, I think one in North and another in Guimhuavu, two in Kigali, uh, in South one in, in Butare. I don't know if I'm not mistaken, but if there's another one, uh, I should know it, but there is a, um, a kind of plan to make it available, but not yet done right now. Yeah, maybe you can see on this table the drawbacks. You can go down a little bit, Arana, so that we can share, uh, discuss about these drawbacks. Yeah, you can stop there. So as you can see for the cylinders, you will require transportation and the supply chain. So you, 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 you are relying on the supplier. 
So for example, if you are, you are living like in the Western province, you will be buying oxygen from maybe Kigali. So it's very difficult to get the oxygen in your center as needed. So there is also risk of gas leakage. So where you are keeping your cylinder, so you may have some accident and uh, unwanted relocation. Um, so for the concentrator, you have low pressure output. So usually not suitable for CPAP, for example, or use of a ventilator machine. So that's a big limitation if you have an ICU. So the concentrator will not help you if your ICU, where you can need the CPAP or use of the ventilator machine. And you need source of electricity all the time. And you need a backup just in case the, your concentrator doesn't work. So, and you require some maintenance. Uh, for the oxygen plant, uh, you need capital investment. So it's somehow expensive. So in my experience at the Green Wavu, I think there was some donation and support from PIH, Partners in Health. So you, you yes, need yes, to... Yes, Jean. Yeah. Jean Paul, what me... do you give me to give you a comment about that? Yeah, okay, As go ahead. previously, I said, the, yeah, I, I want to give a small comment about it. So the oxygen printers, the oxygen plant, as you said, it requires, it is in the biggest hospital. Like, I'm saying the context of Rwanda, in the setting of Rwanda. So in Chigari, if I saw they have oxygen plant, the oxygen plant, it's like uh, all of us and the, our attendant, they, they know the, the, pheno the, the phenomenon of photosynthesis. It's, these are the machine which are planted somewhere to absorb oxygen in the air with you're, you're nitrogen, just... oxygen, all these compo components of gases which are in the atmosphere and they extract oxygen, like in Faisos, as you said. Sorry? Hello? Okay, we can hear you now. Hello? Okay, thank you. I, I was saying that the, the, print, the oxygen printer the plant of oxygen, how it works. It's, it extracts oxygen from the air, from the atmosphere. If people, they remember the basic of photosynthesis, that is how oxygen is being extracted from the air, from the air with other gases like nitrogen, carbon monoxide, dioxide, and then they extract oxygen to the printer, oxygen printer. From oxygen printers, this is where the oxygen is extracted. And from the printers, they can, they can, they can pull oxygen to the cylinders. And from the cylinders, that's where if oxygen is in the cylinders, it can be used directly to the ventilator machine, to the anesthesia machine, in the theater or in the ICU. Or from the cylinders, it can be connected to the people line. Which is, can be used in the or in the ICU. The pipeline, it's the oxygen cylinders which are connected, as I said, from the size. There is E, it has different capacities of oxygen store. 
different amount of liters of oxygen they can they can store and then from from those if they put together those cylinders you can see a example we are being cut off so maybe we will discuss that during take home messages so oh, let's go back to let's just take a take home message from this discussion and then we can continue so why is this important so for me i think to be able to know our source of oxygen is important so that we know how much we have and how we can use it appropriately because it's a very expensive resource, but also we may have problems if we use too much and then we don't have enough supply. So our patient may have problems. Or if you don't have access to the electricity, for example, and if the electricity is cut off and we, we are using, for example, concentrators, then our patient can, can have complications. So the, the other application is transportation and the RN, really did a good job to explain the type of cylinders from A to E. So there are common cylinders. In my experience, the commonly used was D and E. So, and they have the storage capacity between 340 and 660 liters of oxygen. So if they are full, so you can imagine if we are transporting a patient only five liters per minute, even in one hour, you are, you, your consumption is very high. So it's about 300. So it means if you are transporting someone from, uh, for example, in the West, from uh, Changugu to Kigali, you have maybe six hours of, of transportation. You may need more than three or four or uh, e-cylinders. So, so the application of what you are saying in our patient is very important. So how much supply do we have? How much we need for this particular patient? Done transportation, for example, or in our hospital, how much supply do we have? Or in my own ICU, how much supply do I have? Or in your own operating room? Just keep in mind and be able to read on, on, on the, the pressure you have and then the quantity of the equivalent quantity of liters of oxygen you have so that you can make up a good plan. Are there any addition before we move on? Thank you so much. So before giving my, just a small, a small comment, I'd like to ask you if we, we talk about uh, IPC infection prevention control, why we use such uh, devices. Will we talk about this? Or just no. I can give you You can this. comment on that, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as what we saw in our experience, it was it, all those devices are good, but we find that our infection prevention control was still a bit um, needing much effort. As an example, you know, the concentrators have has two good adv advantages, really good advantages, but we found it as a source of infection. Uh, you can ask me why. You know, we are used to change the mask and plug it like where it is now. So the, the green side, we see it now on the picture. But once we are going to switch the button on and off, sometimes many people don't think about cleaning such the, this side. And we saw many people doing this while we were wearing already mask and putting this on patients. So it was a source of infection. So, uh, all those things are really good, but think about, thinking about also infection, infection prevention control nowadays as we are in, in, a, in a pandemic uh, issue, we should also keep this in mind. Also, the other issue was transportation, as you said, those things are really heavy. And we we're seeing people moving around like two to three carrying this on their shoulder. So it was so risky. Imagine it if, by mistake or just an incident, it was just going to, they were throwing this back just just down. It, it was so risky that can explode. So all those things are really good, but we have to keep in our mind that oxygen is something which is expensive and we need to take care of it and it can cause incident and explosion. My last comment will be about uh, 
how much it is expensive. In one small district hospital, we saw that in one month we can consume around 10 million Rwandan friends, like around, I think, 10,000 USD, if I'm not mistaken. So you see how much it is expensive. So we have to take it seriously and know how much it is expensive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aren. The other thing we need to be aware is how we, we, we store the oxygen cylinders. So if you put the empty and the full cylinders in the same room, there is also some ways to confuse them. And maybe we take an empty cylinder for your patient. Just also remember that. I think we can move to the next, um, to the main session and to the next question. Yeah, we can just summarize what we can apply from what we discussed. So we can do the survey of our own hospital to understand the oxygen supply options available. We can list the number of each of the, the oxygen cylinders, oxygen concentrators, and see what we have. Uh, we have to know if we have pipeline gases, and understand how to the, those supply oxygen supply systems are maintained. We can survey our facility to understand oxygen delivery devices available. It, and as Alan said, remember also the infection control because in our settings, some of oxygen delivery devices are reused. So let's make sure, even if the like the the face mask are reused. Let's make sure they are cleaned appropriately and the, the, there is no risk of infection for our patient. Because in my current practice, all those devices are single use, but I understand our context. It's okay to do to use them, but let us remember infection control. Uh, we, some of those examples include nasal prongs, simple mask, ventilator mask, and masks with reservoir. Understand who is ordering the oxygen, who is maintaining the oxygen, and also who is doing the sterilization of all the medical equipment we use. Um, we are suggesting also to download the, or print the life box triage tool to assist in managing hypoxic patient. So you remember the video we watched? So there is a, a guide from the life box which will give you all that information. So, and it's also available on the learning resource center that Alana has shared. Um, and we are recommending whenever possible to print that tool and post the tool in your, in the, in your department. Okay, uh, those are action items we can think about. And for the next session, please sh share your experience if you have managed to use one of these suggestions, to do one of these suggested actions. Arana, we can go to the next uh, point, please. Thank you. So let us go back to our previous patient. You remember our patient who was, this, who was having suspicion of COVID. So suddenly the pulse oximetry is causing some alarm. And your student is asking, what's wrong of the patient? So yeah. We are going to see the video of that alarm, and then you 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 will see also the answer for that particular question. Can I click on that? Can you interpret this SpO2 tracing? What is the heart rate? What is the SpO2? Yeah, okay, 
please put your answer in the chat. Interpret this. Yeah, well, yeah, you can go back. We don't need the video anymore. I give you like 30 seconds just to put the answer in your chat and then we'll see the our our proposed answer to the question. And then I can go down. Yeah. Go down a little bit again. Yeah. Then I will need uh, I give them 30 seconds and then after that we we'll click on this picture and then we we'll watch a video explaining how the the pulse oximetry works and also some conditions which can cause to give an unreliable uh, answer or unreliable reading. People are very quiet in the chat. So you saw the previous small video. Yeah, okay, I see. Laban is putting the heart rate is 55. SPO283. Anyone disagree? Okay, Jordan is saying all oh, the, the patient is bradycardic. Anyone has a different view? Okay, let me give you a hint. So you can see the, this picture uh, where Arana is showing the a patient of pulse oximetry, showing the saturation of 100%. And the heart rate of 86. You, you can see the tracing. You have a, a good signal there. Do you think this is similar to our previous image? Yeah, you see? Here you don't have a, a strong signal. There is no regular, um, it's not a regular tracing. I don't know if you can see the difference here. But for me, I don't think uh, the, the first reading was a reliable reading. I think something was wrong. Maybe the patient was moving, something like that. But for the interest of time, let us, um, let us watch the video by clicking on this image. Providers using pulse oximetry to diagnose and treat hypoxemia must understand how the pulse oximeter works and understand the limitations to its accuracy. One major goal for most of our patients, whether stable or critically ill, is to maintain adequate oxygen delivery to all the cells and tissues in the body. Oxygenation is the process by which oxygen from the alveoli in the lungs diffuses into the pulmonary capillaries. Once oxygen diffuses into the pulmonary capillaries, the majority binds to hemoglobin within the red blood cells. The hemoglobin that is bound to oxygen is termed oxyhemoglobin. Pulse oximeters are one of the most valuable monitors in patient care. Pulse oximeters measure oxygenation indirectly and are painless for the patient. Pulse oximeters use probes to shine red and infrared light through tissue bed. Red light has a wavelength of 660 nanometers. Infrared light has a wavelength of 940 nanometers. Sensors in the pulse oximeter detect the amount of light absorbed at each wavelength. Through a process called photoplasmography, arterial blood flow is detected by its pulsatile flow. Pulsatile flow generates an alternating current designated AC. Non-pulsatile flow in the tissues are canceled out. Non-pulsatile sources include venous blood and tissues. The pulse oximeter then calculates a ratio of oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin in arterial blood only. 
This ratio is then displayed as a percentage on the pulse oximeter screen. The pulse oximeter comes with a probe and a computerized unit. The first step is to place the probe on the patient's finger, toe, or earlobe. In small children and infants, the probe may extend over the entire hand or foot. Next, make sure the unit is powered on. Some pulse oximeters require batteries or charging, so it is optimal to ensure adequate power to the device at all times. The pulse oximeter should display the pulse rate and the SpO2 or oxygen saturation. Many devices also display a waveform. It is important to check that this waveform corresponds to the patient's pulse or the electrocardiogram tracing. This will ensure the accuracy of the values being recorded. There is also an audible beep. That beep corresponds to each heartbeat. It sounds like this. Most pulse oximeters also have the capability to change the tone of the beep with changing values of oxygenation. The higher the SpO2, the higher the tone. The lower the SpO2, the lower the tone. Changing tones with changing SpO2 is called tone modulation. It sounds like this for an SpO2 of 100%. And it sounds like this for an SpO2 of 85%. There are several limitations to pulse oximetry. Most limitations lead to a falsely low SpO2 reading. Movement shivering, and electrocautery interfere with the probe's ability to detect pulsatile arterial blood flow. Similarly, abnormal heart rhythms can interfere with the pulse needed for photoplasmography. Met hemoglobin absorbs light similarly at 660 and 940 nanometers, which leads to an inaccurate ratio and usually an SpO2 approximating 85%. Similarly, many injectable dyes can also cause a false low SpO2 reading. Carbon monoxide leads to a falsely high SpO2 reading as it absorbs light at the same wavelength of oxyhemoglobin. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I hope that was clear. I if there is any question or addition from the panelists, you are welcome. So question can be put in the chat and the panelists, they can just um, yeah, give their comments. In the meantime, Arana, we can go back to the main session. Okay, so as you can see, the issue of that the previous reading was that the patient was the pulse ox oximeter was off the patient finger, and after the positioning, SpO two was ninety five. That's this, the answer to the question. Um, so we are almost towards the end, uh, but so the other question we need to think about is how to clean properly. Uh, the pulse oximeters. So how do you really clean the pulse oximeters? Um, people can share their experience, but 
Um, the recommendation is in this video. Let's watch the video. Between patients, it is essential that you gently clean with medical alcohol. Small amounts of 70% alcohol-based hand rub will also work, but should be applied sparingly. It's important to keep the LED and photo detector clean. Please also remember to wash your hands following proper protocol between patients. The oximeter should be wiped down regularly using common detergent and non-corrosive disinfectant, such as those used in hospitals. Be aware that many kinds of detergents must be diluted prior to use. The oximeter case and screen can be wiped with a lint-free soft cloth or a sponge moistened in detergent. While cleaning the oximeter, be careful not to spill liquid onto the instrument and do not allow any liquid to spill inside the oximeter. When wiping the side panel of the oximeter, be especially careful to keep liquid away from the cable and the outlet. Thank you very much for, for sh sh sharing the video. Um, so we have already covered a lot of things, but before we, we go back to the objectives, I would like everyone to think about what we have discussed. And then we are going to have a um, few minutes, about five minutes in the groups where we can discuss, um, we, can, we can discuss our take home points and also how we can apply what we discussed in our, in our usual practice. So we have three groups. Um, uh, Kevin is going to help us draft those three groups. Uh, one group, uh, I will be part of the one group. And then Ale will have another group. And Jean-Paul will have the third group. And me, Ale, and Jean-Paul will summarize what we discussed. And then we'll bring that to the main uh, discussion. Everyone will have a few minutes to to, to, to share what each group has discussed as taken point and are the things they can use in their regular practice. Thank you. We can also answer some of the questions like the question from Joseline uh, asking more clarification on irregular oximetry trace. What, what are the potential causes? We will discuss that as well. Now we can wait to be uh, to have um, to be sent in the groups. So Joseline Gilani, as a for your question, you can really also open the article we shared. There's a good um, a good table, a good image showing all those um, uh, different uh, irregular oximetry traces. You can find that, and we have already shared the link to the article in the chat, it was on the WhatsApp group. Hello. Hello. 
uh, Rahul, uh, can you transfer the uh, host access to Alana? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Eugene, I think that there's a little delay on that end in getting the room set up. So maybe if you want to address one more question while we're all together, um, we should set up the rooms in just 30 seconds or so. Yeah, sure. The, the, yeah. I, I'm trying to, to share the article about the questions they asked because the, the video, um, I mean, the, the question they are asking, it's good to show the image rather than discussing about it. So let me see if I can share my screen. Can I share my screen? Yeah, you should be able to. <clears throat> yeah. People can see what they, they were asking. So Jocelyn was asking about uh, like the abnormal waveform. As you can see, the normal waveform is the regular waveform here on the top. But if you have a raw perfusion, you, you will have like a tracheline raw perfusion. And many things can cause raw perfusion, including vasoconstriction, shock, um, maybe um, cold, many things which can cause raw perfusion in your extremity. You will have a tracing like this. And noise or artifact uh, or a lot of light or maybe, um, yeah, you, you will see that kind of tracing, which is very irregular. Uh, and for when the patient is moving, um, you have some part which seems irregular and others are, seen, are very irregular like this motion artifact. So I think it's easier to see this uh, uh, rather than discussing about them. But all we are looking for really is a good normal signal which is irregular tracing like this one on the top. And do you have any addition on this? or more clarification. There was a good question about this um, issue once we, we we see also light. So just I saw in my experience that uh, some uh, theater lights were causing issue by uh, just uh, mistaking us once we're taking the pulse ox image. So um, I saw this question. I think you already responded on it. And um, also to get the good size of uh, probe is also a good thing. Just we're still struggling uh, with this and you know it from our side. Yeah, but for the kids, you can use the big toe. The big toe, uh, yeah. sometimes it may work. Um, yeah. And also they recommend to, to have the baby with the mother if you're in the world. Yeah. Um, so that the yeah. bed is not moving too much. Yeah. That's true. So I hope we answered your question, Josephine. And you have the article, you can read more about this if you like. Okay, everyone, the breakout rooms are ready. So in just a moment, you'll be invited to join either room one, two, or three. And then you'll have five minutes to you know, ask questions and discuss um, anything or clarify anything from today's module. And then we'll come back to the main session for conclusion. Start and then uh, Ale will follow and jump on. Okay, for our group, uh, we had uh, many uh, take home points. So the first one was about the decisions about escalating oxygen therapy. Mm -hmm. The decisions about escalating oxygen therapy. Uh, the second one was uh, indication of when to measure um, SpO2. Or indication of when to measure oxygen saturation. Um, the third one was different tracing for oxygen saturation reading.
Yeah, thank you. So the fourth one is considerations for oxygen use during, during transportation. During, during transportation. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, evaluating the sources, sources of oxygen in our own setting. and the consideration for infection control while using oxygen delivery device. Oxygen delivery device and the SPO2. Yeah, it's a good list, I think. People started very quiet, but I think they really, they, they got a lot from this discussion. So we can uh, read the next group, Are sharing the take home point. Thank you. So uh, on our side, we got a bit of issue of communication. I think it was uh, my mic, so which was not talking, I'm not sure. But one of our participants helped us to get the, um, some key point to go back. So he insisted on how to use a, a pulse oximeter and uh, how to use a pulse oximeter and uh, and, uh, and he was happy that now he's able to understand there's a uh, tracing and uh, waves i mean waves and their meaning um he was also uh, happy to help us to remember some principle of infection prevention control as you are using this pulse oximeter and moving from a patient to another one uh, so to clean our hand, to clean the device, also think about using uh, agents like uh, alcohol-based, mm, to pay attention not to, to use things which can cause corrosion. And the last point that he brought back, uh, he brought out was also about uh, how to clean airways um, devices. Uh, he was about to explain it, but we, we went back to the main group. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Paul. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, as I take a message. As you mentioned, uh, is uh, if a patient is is needing oxygen, which device are you going to use? It's very important. And high, how much FiO2 are you going to deliver? And we what is the maximum flow of each device? That's one. Number two, what is the source of oxygen? Am I using a concentrator? Am I using oxygen cylinder? What is the source of oxygen do I have? It's another component. Again, as you insist that it's better when you are using a cylinder to know when the cylinder will be empty. By reading the, the, the manometers, according to the type of cylinder, is it type E, is it type H? For example, we are cutting off. How much pressure do I have in the, the manometers and able to oxygen remain in the cylinder? Jump up, that, that's all. So uh, I was, the, the last point was escalating the care. If a patient is on oxygen, when do you consider to win off from oxygen? Because long standing oxygen on a patient is very hypo, is very dangerous and hard us. So you need to, if your patient is on oxygen, when do you, when 
can you win from oxygen? It's another point. This is my point as a take home message. If a patient is in oxygen, please remind it to win off oxy from oxygen whenever is needed. That is the end of my, me my message. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean Paul. So, Don't yeah, you gave good advice. Yeah, so I think there was also a good a question in the chat about how to calculate the oxygen for transportation. So, but as Jean Paul and the Aaron said previously, it depends on the type of the cylinder you have. So, and as Aaron said, you have cylinders from A to, to, to H. So, but the, for my experience, the common cylinder I was seeing was D and E. So, and for D cylinders, those small cylinders, they have about 300 liters when they are full. And for, for E, they have about 600. And H, it, it's a big cylinder. It can hold about 7,000. Liters. But then once you know the, the available pressure, you can calculate easily the remaining um, the remaining oxygen. Yeah. And then once you have your you know your 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 available oxygen, you can see the consumption looking on how much you are giving. For example, if you are giving five liters per minute, then every hour you are giving five liters times 60 minutes about 300 liters. So that small cylinder will be finished in just one hour. So there is a, a formula, I don't need to share the formula here, but, uh, but you can find maybe an article and we'll share the article to the WhatsApp group. That would be the better way. But in general, you need to know the type of cylinder, how much oxygen is in the cylinder and Usually what we use are cylinders D and E uh, most of the time. So we, and those cylinders, they have about 300, 600 liters. Yes, Jean Paul, go ahead. Then if you allow me, if you allow me about the formula, it's simple. Uh, actually, uh, all of us, we, we remember the basic of uh, phys physics and the chemistry we learn. When you put volume one, times pressure one, it's equal to pressure two and the volume two. And there is an only pressure. When a cylinder is full, there is an only pressure. It, according to the type of cylinder, this, as you mentioned, like, like a cylinder E, there is a known pressure when the cylinder is full. And there is a known volume when the, the, the cylinder is full times to the remaining pressure and then you can know how much volume is known it's a it's a mathematical formula and uh, i'm sure those people who are working in the referral hospital and working with the, some anesthesiologist it's easier if you are working it's if there is around an anesthesiologist you can you can ask how much volume remain in the cylinder i'm sure each anesthesiologist can help you to understand this formula and how much volume remain in the cylinder. Those who are working in the district hospital, it's the basic formula. Volume one, pressure one, equal to volume two and pressure two. So you can find easily the reference. Thank you. I put everything Jean Paul said in the chat. I, I thought it was not very easy to explain, but as he said, I put everything in the chat. So, as you you know, as he said, you have pressure one and the volume one, we, which are already known. And then the pressure two, you can read that on the manometer, which is the pressure which is remaining. And then you can have pressure one times volume one. You divide by the pressure two that you have read on the manometer. Then you have a calculation of the volume two. And then once you have the volume two, which is the remaining volume, you can calculate the time you have by dividing, dividing by the consumption of 
oxygen per each hour, depending on what you are giving. So, but it's good to think about that before you leave the hospital so that you, you plan accordingly. Ale, do you have any addition to that? Good for me to use. Just uh, the first idea you gave was uh, just to guide people out to think this uh, broadly, but this is a good for me also to use. The one which was the taking that emergency cylinder contained around 66 hundred sixty hundred to seventy hundred liters of oxygen and the biggest one h was around seven sixty thousand six thousand to seven thousand liter of oxygen then knowing how much you give per hour it will give us a good uh, uh, approach although this formula is the great one yeah but as i said it's good also to be practical so if you have a small one and you are giving one five liters per minute then you have about one hour. If you have the H, if you have the other one, which is the, the E, you have about two hours. Then if you have uh, the big one, which is H, you have about 10 times that. So you have enough time. You have about 10 hours or more. So th to make it practical, I think that's enough. So we can go back to our take home point and then uh, we'll be able to conclude uh, our session today. Alana, you can help us to go to our main session. So, but in the meantime, I have also a good news to share. So we'll be able to provide CPD point to participants and about 30 uh, point for all the sessions. So yeah, just to review what we discussed, we discussed about oxygen supply devices, cylinders, concentrators, plants, uh, non-invasive oxygen delivery devices, um, oxygen therapy escalation, uh, and using pulse oximetry for triage and oxygen therapy. And we discussed about potential limitation for price oximetry. Um, this one will be discussed later. Acute respiratory failure will be discussed for the next session. Uh, so I, I really, I would like to thank everyone for your participations and uh, your feedback is welcome. You can always give us feedback through the WhatsApp group of the things you can improve next time. Um, and um, we are looking forward to having our next session or at the end of the next month. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe we can stay on the call with all the panelists and a center with, who, who help us in the communication with the, the group. Uh, we can let others um, go and have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Yes, and, and Dr. Eugene, if I could have a minute. I, um, Dr. Anna um, Crawford was wondering if we could show participants how to log in to the Learning Resource Center. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, everyone. So uh, the link that we shared in the chat is to the Learning Resource Center. And this is a course platform that um, our uh, Dr. Anna Crawford from Stanford created for this program. Um, and it has all of the resources that uh, um, Dr. Eugene and Dr. Elaine and, and Dr. Ira Kose uh, went over today. And uh, you can use this on both your computer or your phone. The link will send you to a page that looks like this. Um, just click on the sign in button. If you haven't registered before, you can register um, for free. Um, but once you do register and you have your account information, um, logging in will send you to a page that looks like this. And so there are a lot of courses on the Learning Resource Center. There's a course on oxygen, which is the one that we're doing now. There's one on critical care, on COVID, um, and then some others. You're, you're welcome to check them all out. But to access the, the resources that we went over today, you would click on the oxygen series. 
once you click on the oxygen series, you scroll down, you go to module two, oxygen and critical care, the case-based series. And then today's session is part two, uh, diagnosing hypoxemia and pulse oximetry. And so when you click on that, um, it will take you to what we presented today. So um, uh, the case of the, of the man with hypoxemia um, and all of the information that, went, that we went over. Um, and the site is very interactive. And so um, throughout the site, you can click on different boxes and it will take you to the different videos and, and articles that um, we were sharing today. So um, Dr. Anna just wanted us to, to show you that so that you're welcome to check it out and review um, in between sessions. Uh, but we will also be sharing um, the recording in the chat if, if that's easier as well. Um, and so, <laughs> Uh, my last reminder is just that we do have some WhatsApp groups that are set up to help um, create a space to, to ask questions between sessions. And so to join that, you can scan the QR code that's on the screen here, um, or you can message um, uh, Assist International and we will add you to the group. So our email is here. And, and that's it for me. So um, Rahul, instead of ending the meeting, I think we will let participants leave. And then Dr. Eugene was saying that we could keep the panelists on to do um, a very uh, quick debriefing, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, Arana. So before they go, can you explain to them how they register for each session? It was a little bit confusing for a few people. Sure, sure. So the link that you will receive in the um, <coughs> uh, emails and WhatsApp, it asks you to put in your, your name and your email address. And I know it can be a little a lot to do it each week, but that allows us to track your attendance so that at the end of the course, we know um, who um, will be eligible for the CPD credits. But once you do fill out that information, um, you will get an email with a link that you can click on each week to directly access the session. Um, and so if you save that link, it will work for all of the classes. So uh, if you register once and you fill out your name and your email once, and then you save the link that you get um, that you get to access the session, you can use that to access the session every week. If you if you lose that link, um, then each week you just have to enter your email and your your name to get into the session. Um, and we we are emailing that and we are sending it through WhatsApp. So hopefully, um, it it's clear how to access that. Thank you very much. Yeah. We, Great. We so can, good, yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> good.